Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Heart disease remains the number one killer of both men and women in the United States. But we are making progress. People are living longer than ever before. Now, one of the ways that heart specialists can help people whose heart is failing is with a ventricular assist device, or VAD, or VAD. A VAD. Yeah. All right. Tell us about that. What is it? It's an implantable (laughs) mechanical pump that helps pump blood from the lower chambers of your heart, the ventricles, out to the rest of the body. It's used for several different reasons, including for some patients while they wait for a heart transplant. And here to tell us more about the ventricular assist device and heart transplants is Mayo Clinic cardiothoracic surgeon, Dr. John Stulak. Welcome to the program, Dr. Stulak. Truly an honor. Long time listener, first time (laughs) contestant, I guess. So... (laughs) First time caller. Well, we used to take phone calls, but not anymore. Yeah, and when we're done, I'm just going to tell you right now, you get to take that coffee mug unless you mess up, so don't mess up. (laughs) Now you just raised the stakes and realize. Okay. (laughs) VAD, ventricular ventricular assist device. And by the way, I'm kind of impressed with how much you've learned since you started doing this program. The ventricles. I mean, Mm -hmm. you said that just right. So tell us about this device and, and when you use it. Sure. This is uh, what we would call a treatment for advanced heart failure. Some patients can be maintained on medications. The uh, device um, really is for the patient who's failing despite optimal medical management. So it's an unconventional solution. Um, But uh, in the last 20, 25 years, dramatic improvements have been made in the device design, our knowledge about the treatment, perioperative care, et cetera. And uh, it's kind of space age in the beginning. You think you implant this device and it's artificial and it's not the total artificial heart. This only helps one side of the of the heart. But uh, it is a device and patients carry around batteries. It gets powered. And yes, they will set off uh, metal detectors at the airport, et cetera. But uh, it truly is a life saving therapy. um, But it has a good 25 year track record. Is it like a backpack size or a lunch bag size? What is it? Yeah, the, the, the peripheral components have improved and gotten smaller, as have the pumped uh, designs. So peripheral, you mean what is on the outside? The what is on the outside, device? exactly. Okay. So the device gets implanted into the left ventricle, hooked up to the aorta, which is the main uh, artery, leaving the uh, b- uh, heart that gives to the body. So the left yeah. ventricle is the part of the, the heart that pumps the blood out to the rest of the body? That is correct. And is that the one, the part of the heart that fails most often? Most often, that is correct. And due to heart attack, or there's many reasons we can kind of go into that a little bit, who are candidates, et cetera. But from a device standpoint, tremendous modifications through the years. They've gotten smaller, they're easier to implant, more durable. Um, since the um, uh, improvements in kind of the early 2000s, really there has not been a mechanical failure of these pumps, so very durable. So patients can live 10, 15 plus years. So if you look at a patient who's not a transplant candidate, has advanced heart failure, you could put this in. Not only do they live longer compared to medical management, they also um, feel better. Every study has shown improved quality of life with these. And how do you implant this? What does it take? Yeah, what this kind is of surgery? open heart surgery. It th- is. Through the breastbone, on the heart lung machine. That's the standard way. Um, for patients who are abridged to transplant or, or in whom we are putting this to get them to a transplant, we could do a mini incision on the side of the chest and then a small incision to hook it up to the aorta. So we can put this in in a minimally invasive fashion as well. But there's a wire that comes out right through the chest wall that's connected to, what, a battery? That is true. The, um, this is probably the, the Achilles heel of this therapy is that patients have a power cord basically exiting their body. It goes into the peripheral components. We kind of got off track Mm -hmm. from that, but hooked up to a battery and a controller. They're small. Patients can wear them on their belt. Um, And uh, some patients get fishing jackets, hunting jackets to put all their little, it's kind Mm -hmm. of a bat type thing. Mm -hmm. Um, But there is actually um, several companies that um, really help with the peripherals. You know, a lot of patients accessorize. They have different bags, different coats and jackets, et cetera. They, They have fun with it. And when you say advanced heart failure, that means that everything else, pretty much non-invasive, has been tried. That is exactly right. Okay. And typically the history is that these patients have chronic heart failures over a period of five, 10 years. And how many people are there like that in the United States? Well, millions of people, like we talk about, have heart failure, the garden variety heart failure, advanced heart failure, one to 200,000, I think, per year. 
uh, have what we call advanced heart failure and who would be candidates for this therapy. So everyone who's using a VAD is waiting for a heart transplant? Not necessarily. Okay. So we can put in the heart, uh, the, the LVAD, either as a bridge, mm -hmm. if you're a candidate for a heart transplant, someone's failing, you put in the device, it helps you know, take blood to the whole body, it keeps them preserved until a point where they get a heart transplant. That's called the bridge to transplant or BTT. Now, destination therapy is someone who is not a transplant candidate. So um, we can talk about uh, who's a transplant candidate in a bit, but uh, if you're not a candidate, you get it, and that's called destination therapy. Not quite Hawaii as a destination, but destination therapy, you could live, we have people over a decade on the device. Really? Yeah. And, they, and they simply don't fail. But I suspect you have to be pretty careful that your batteries are charged. Oh, that's right. They get, these patients get extensive uh, education. Uh, one of the requirements is that they have a caregiver who can help them. Um, and so that caregiver also gets the education. So each battery only lasts between eight and 10 hours, but you have two sets of batteries. So it could be up to kind of 16 to 20 hours. You take one out, you recharge them. It's kind of like your phone it dies and or gets lower and you recharge it. Is, I mean, you say they keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, what is going to be the I mean, can you make it small enough that it's something that is implanted and then can be charged like we've got, as you're using phones as an example, you've got phones that can be charged just by holding something against it? I think the, the next big frontier with um, device therapy is to make it wireless, fully implantable like a pacemaker. Mm -hmm. They can't get that small. A pacemaker generator is very small. But to get to get to the point where you don't have this thing exiting you, I think that's the biggest detractor in terms of patients. There is great research out there and some prototypes. They've actually powered a device, uh, totally implantable, um, for about three hours. So we're getting there, we're not quite there, but uh, the charging system would be analogous to like your uh, cordless toothbrush, where you kind of sit it in a pod. You have a receiver mm -hmm. coil and a power source, et cetera, and it would charge you know, through your skin. So that's kind of the next step. You know, I know surgeons don't always like to talk about the complications, but That's I'm right. sure there are some. You said reliability is, is not a problem with this device, but there have to be others. And, and the fact that you mentioned there is a cord that comes out through the chest wall, infection has to be an issue, doesn't it? Absolutely. There's a myriad of complications, and that's why we really look at patients to see are they a candidate or not. These patients are on blood thinners. The, the majority of the cardiac output goes through these devices. And so they can get clot in there. If, they're, um, too, uh, if their blood is too thin on the blood thinner, they can bleed. Um, the the driveline, again, not only is it a, det a detractor from quality of life, but it is the interface between the outer dirty world and the inner sterile world. And so that is about 30% of patients can, can get infection of that driveline. And do they have to, uh, I presume, care for that on a daily basis and put some sort of antibiotic ointment around it? Or how do they care for it? Surprisingly, this heals very well. Uh, the skin is amazing, just heals around that area. But typically what happens, it, to answer your question, yes, they, they care for it on a every other day basis or so. Um, but if you tug that drive line and break the integrity, then that's usually the setup for the infection. So yeah, it is meticulous care of that drive line. If you're, uh, how do you recharge the batteries? Can you plug this thing into a wall outlet also? Yes, if the patient's at home or uh, at a place with an outlet, yeah, they have a console and they can plug the device and the controller into the wall. They don't need to be on battery power at all. Uh, but if they're up and mobile and out living their life, like most of our patients we hope return to um, you know, productive life, um, they're on their batteries. So while at home, yeah, they can be hooked up to the wall. So you said there's 100 to 200,000 uh, people in the United States who are potential candidates. How many of these have you done? This is the great irony, big frustration. Um, from, a, from a VAD perspective, only about five to 7,000 implants per year. And you're looking, you're right, at 100, 150,000 people who are potential candidates for it. Um, and there's many reasons for that. Referrals, uh, when to refer, who is a candidate. I think a lot of... Um, misunderstanding perhaps in the field about who would be a candidate for it. And I think some referrer, uh, referring physicians are maybe afraid of the therapy, like we talked about, a lot of complications. You got this power cord, et cetera. Do the patients really want to live like that? But sure. it is um, very stable therapy, very durable, and the outcomes just get better and better. Well, who is a candidate or, or what would make you not a candidate? Sure. Um, so we, they go through an extensive evaluation, not quite as extensive as transplant, uh, unless you're a bridge to transplant with the device. But from 
from the standpoint and what CMS, the insurance companies, and from a clinical standpoint, if your ejection fraction is less than 25% and you have an exercise capacity below 30% of predicted, you are a candidate, uh, barring anything else like you're on dialysis or have COPD and you're on home oxygen therapy. Basically, if your end organs are preserved and you are dealing with heart failure, you're a potential candidate. All right, our guest is heart surgeon Dr. John Stulak. We've been talking about the ventricular assist device, which in many patients is used as a bridge to transplant. Time for a short break. When we come back, we will talk about heart transplants with Dr. John Stulak. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Our guest is heart surgeon Dr. John Stulak. We've been talking about the ventricular assist device, which in many cases is used as a bridge to transplant, meaning the patient has uh, extensive bad heart failure and they're waiting for a heart transplant. So the first heart transplant, if uh, I'm correct, was done about 30 years ago. And how many have you done since? How many have been done since? Yeah, at Mayo Clinic, it was about 30 years. Actually, the field just celebrated the 50th anniversary of the first heart transplant done in South Africa. Um, but uh, yes, our program started in the late 1980s uh, by Christopher McGregor and uh, Richard Daly, uh, one of whom, Dr. Daly, is still the head of the program here. Uh, we do between 30 and 40 per year. Um, we are in kind of the 80th percentile of programs. We're very proud of that. And um, this year is headed to be a banner year. Um, halfway through the year here, we've done in the mid 20s. So we are mm, we're headed for a banner year. Um, so about 500 plus transplants. So you would do more if there were more donors, right? Absolutely. I mean, you've got how many people in the in the country on the waiting list? Yes. Um, a couple thousand, okay. about 3,000 or so uh, on the waiting list. If you look at transplant from an epi epidemiology. Um, standpoint between 2000 and about 2200 have been done very consistently for the last 20 to 25 years basically it's limited by donor availability there's only so many donors but if you look from a um, that's why we're talking about LVAD is such a good therapy for um, for advanced heart failure it is because the limitations of, of heart transplantation um, it's basically based on donor availability. Now, our, um, our uh, catchment area is Minnesota and the two Dakotas. So by area, we have the largest donor area in the country. However, as you know, with living up here, it's mm -hmm. a very sparse in population. So really, population drives the donor pool. So big cities, metropolitan areas. If you need a heart transplant, are you better off going and living in a big city? I mean, do you have a better chance of getting a transplant if you're in a big city? And aren't most of the people who are donors trauma victims? That is correct. Trauma victims, the uh, victims of violence. Unfortunately, we say the knife and gun club, mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, that's why the big city, you know, basically high density population areas. So even if when we have patients on our transplant list, uh, we do, if the patient's sick enough, encourage patients to get dual listed, um, and they do. They may go to New York and be double listed in here in Columbia, let's say, or something like that. So, you know, it does, um, it, it does increase the, uh, the chances. A lot of our patients in Mayo, Arizona, they go to be double listed there because they have a nice catchment area of the Los Angeles area, mm -hmm. Phoenix, Scottsdale, et cetera. So their donor pool is, heavy, is heavier. Um, so from our standpoint, we do encourage patients uh, potentially to get dual listed. How long between the time uh, the heart, the person dies and the transplant, how long do you have? How long can you preserve that, that heart? Usually uh, from the minute we uh, cross clamp and harvest the heart at the donor hospital, um, and this is what limits where we can get donors sure. from, about four hours to get it in the patient for an adult. Pediatrics can go a little longer, but about four hours. So the minute you harvest that heart, it's lights and sirens to the airport, it's from the airport, it's to the donor hospital, and then we sew it in in a very expedited fashion. So about four hours. Is it's, there it's a code three, yeah, sorry. Um, but what if the patient, let's say someone got shot, doesn't it take a while before they get to the hospital where you can harvest the heart? Oh yeah, so we're talking about donors who are brain dead. And so uh, everything else is functioning. So they are probably at any of these donors are giving up a liver, kidneys, small bowel, pancreas, et cetera. There's many lungs. Uh, there's many different organs. So from a brain death perspective, usually we're hearing about a potential donor. And it's usually not until 24 hours later mm -hmm. that things are actually happening because there's such an extensive workup for someone to be a donor and then to place all these organs. 
Is there a main reason why people need a heart transplant? Is there one category that's larger than others? There's two main reasons. One is what we call ischemic cardiomyopathy or coronary artery disease. Uh, patients may have had multiple heart attacks through the years. The other one we don't have a reason for and we call it idiopathic cardiomyopathy or the dilated cardiomyopathy. Those typically make up about 90% of the garden variety advanced heart failure. The muscle just doesn't work. Just doesn't work. There's either an inherent cardiomyopathy or they've had heart attacks where there's now scar. And so going back to the VAD, then does that work better for both of those camps? Yeah, both of those camps, you know, would be candidates for the LVAD okay. as well. Um, now the LVAD is good at helping the left side of the heart, but you also have a right ventricle, like we talked about the ventricles of the heart. And so, that's the one that pumps, gets the blood from the body and pumps it to the lungs. That is correct. Now with an LVAD, it doesn't really help the right side of the heart. So if you have someone who has very bad biventricular heart failure, for instance, here at Mayo Clinic, one of the big populations we have is the amyloid population or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. That is a cardiomyopathy that affects both ventricles. So if you have a severely dysfunctional right ventricle, you're not a good LVAD candidate. So right. th that would be an indication where you'd prefer heart transplant over LVAD. I know the surgery takes a while, but tell <coughs> us about it uh, from start to finish. What, sure. what, what do you do? It's uh, kind of like a wedding. You'd think that uh, more things would go wrong between the donor team, us implanting, et cetera, but uh, depends on how many prior operations the uh, patient has had. Um, but typically four to six hours by the time we kind of do the sternotomy, get in there. Sternotomy mean you, you split the breastbone. We go right through the breastbone on the heart-lung machine. And, and we then try you to open up the chest. Sure do. Okay. And then we try to time it so that we remove the old sick heart as the new donor team is bringing in the new heart. And then we sew it right in. And the patient is asleep and they're on bypass. That is correct. When do you put them on bypass? Uh, basically, when we know the donor team has landed in the plane and that they're safe on the ground, then we remove the heart. We go on the heart-lung machine, remove the heart. And then it's just a matter of sewing everything back together. That is correct. Pretty easy, huh? <laughs> Pretty easy. <laughs> just like that, easy peasy. Yeah. Is it heart only or is it usually heart and lung? Is there a combination? One of the differentiators here at Mayo is we do a lot of combined organ transplants. Um, heart kidneys for the kidney failure, heart liver kidneys for the amyloid population that also affects the heart. We have about 15% of our uh, transplants that we do are combined organs. We've even done a heart, lung, liver, kidney. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we- Heart, we, lung, liver, kidney. That that's is correct. That's like a complete makeover. <laughs> that is. All right, that's so that. the plane lands. You say, all right, the plane is safely landed. We can take out the bad heart. Yep. Then what do you, you get the new one just sewn in, yep. snap your fingers. Well, what do you do to get it start? How do you know that it's going to work? The heart's an amazing organ. You give it blood and it'll start pumping. It has an internal pacemaker and the majority of the time we take off the cross clamp, give it blood, and that heart starts right back up after sitting in a bucket of ice for four hours. You don't have starts. to shock it not, normally. Not typically. No, yeah. Pretty neat. Sometimes huh? yes, but yeah, the heart's an amazing organ. So what's the future hold? I mean, what's your hope for the future, both with regard to the bad, which I think you've talked about, is that the devices have come a long ways, but hopefully they will someday be wireless. What about heart transplants? I mean, the, the big problem is not enough donors, right? And there's yeah. not a lot you can do about that. No, there's not. Um, a lot of research is going into xenotransplantation where you, you can genetically engineer a baboon um, to have it be that patient's genetic subtype. A lot of work was done here uh, by Dr. McGregor, who started the program to potentially grow a heart for I people. I thought you were using pigs. You well, switched to baboons? There's pigs, baboons. The baboon is the closest to the human, but I think the next frontier is stem cells and being able to, quote, grow a heart uh, in a jar. Then you wouldn't have to worry about the rejection. Then there would be no rejection. You're going to grow it to be I genetically I, you know, identical to that person. That's going to be an exciting show when we get to do that one. That's right. You might have to switch to orthopedics after that. Well, if you can grow none, heart, of the, yeah. none of this is like doing a hip replacement yeah, no, or an amputation. Not nearly like, that difficult. Yeah, exactly. That's right. All right, our guest is heart surgeon, Dr. John Stulak. We've talked about the ventricular assist device, or VAD. It's a lifesaver for many patients with heart failure or those with heart failure who are waiting for a heart transplant. Someday they may be wireless, which would be a huge advance. And we've talked about heart transplants, truly the gift of life. There are unfortunately 3,000 people on the waiting list, but you're doing 40 or 50 every year at the Mayo Clinic. That's correct. Dr. John Stulak, thanks so much for being with us. An honor to be here with two celebrities. Yeah. <laughs>